The Chronicles of Riddick, the second film in the franchise series, was written and directed by David Tuohy and released in 2004. The film features an all-star cast, including Dame Judi Dench, Tandy Way Newton, Carl Urban, and Vin Diesel as Riddick. The movie takes place in 2583. Now, I saw Pitch Black years ago, and I loved it. I don't remember if I'd seen this sequel, but I'd come across some stills from the movie recently, and I knew that it was worthy of a watch. It's on Netflix if you want to check it out for yourself. The movie was a critical flop, but in my opinion, it's not as bad as the reviews would have you believe it, and there is plenty of action to keep you entertained. However, what raises the bar for me are the stunning visuals, production, and costume design, in particular, the -the off-the-chart style of the Necromongers. Before we proceed, this video will contain mild spoilers. The costume designers haven't given any interviews on the film, so for the sake of this video, I'm going off the -the behind-the-scenes video, my own observations, and information I have gleaned from the prop store auction house, who also took excellent pictures that I'll share in this video. You can still find some screen accurate costumes and weapons available on some other auction sites if you are looking to pick up some memorabilia. In the movie, the Necromongers are a race of alien conquerors who are led by the Necromonger Lord Marshall. They are characterized by their metallic armor and their desire to conquer and enslave other worlds. Like the Borg from Star Trek Next Generation from 1987, The Necromongers invade planets and assimilate other living species and will kill those who refuse to be assimilated and convert to the Necromonger religion. According to IMDb, the Necromongers were strongly influenced by the Romans, but production designer Holger Gross stated that their aesthetics are inspired by Baroque architecture. Baroque is a period in Europe from the 17th and 18th century that came to describe an extravagant style of art characterized by curving lines, gilt, and gold. The necro armors also feature these details with the embossed and brushed gold creatures on the pauldrons and helmets. Dame Vaco also was featured wearing heavy gold collars, a girdle, and hair ornamentation. I can't identify how many costumes are in the film, but I'd say that it's in the hundreds. The production budget was somewhere in the neighborhood of between 105 million and 120 million, four to five times more than the budget of Pitch Black. Producer Scott Krupp said in the making of the Chronicles of Riddick video that the building of the sets and doing all the wardrobe was an enormous undertaking. There are a million moving parts when you build sets this size and you have to fill them up with people, build wardrobe for them, and you just can't pull anything out of stock because they just don't have any necro armor anywhere. The costumes for the film were designed by the late Michael Dennison and Ellen Morozhnik. The two designers have frequently collaborated on films directed by Paul Verhoeven, such as Starship Troopers and Basic Instinct. The pair likely used their experience in making science fiction armors on Starship Troopers, released seven years before in 1997. You can even check out my review of the costumes from Striptease, also designed by Ellen Morozhnik. I'll leave a link for you in my pinned comment. Now, according to IMDb, Morozhnik replaced Michael Dennison, who had worked on the movie for about eight months, with only 10 weeks before shooting. Bob Morgan, who went on to co-design the costumes for Dune 2021 and appears to be returning for its sequel, was the costume supervisor on the picture. The costumes worn by the non-necromonger characters, in particular Riddick, appear to be influenced by Pitch Black with costume design by Anna Borghese. The grittiness and distressing of the costumes also recall other sci-fi masterpieces, including those worn in Alien and Blade Runner. I credit costume designers like the late John Mallow and Charlie Node for this change in science fiction in the late 70s and early 80s. Four of Riddick's costumes, including his well-established black goggles, were put up for auction. Both of Riddick's ice and snow costumes went unsold. In the auction pictures, you can see that the undershirt of his snow costume is faked with the applique added to a peach t-shirt. 
This was likely done to keep actor Vin Diesel and his stuntman cooler. I love seeing the close-up details of his costumes because you can see how much aging and distressing is done, helping to believe that Riddick has likely been wearing these clothes for years. I found a few pictures of Riddick's tank and trouser costume. Like I said earlier, when worn with his goggles, this is a throwback to his costume in pitch black. Diesel's Necromonger costume, meanwhile, sold at auction in 2020 for almost 4,400 pounds. Two of Kira's costumes were also sold at auction by another auction house. This included her hero tank top and pants, her stuntman's costume, and her Necromonger convert outfit that included a unitard and cloak. Now, in juxtaposition to the gray and black of the Necromongers, Arian, an air elemental, is dressed in cream and white. According to IMDb, Dame Judy Dench's dress was made from crushed Swarovski crystal. I'm not sure what they mean by that. It appears that they have set Swarovski crystals on the cross sections of the mesh that make up her sleeves and front of her bodice. The rest of her gown seems to be made of cream silk. And I think her wig looks great and it ties in nicely with her costume, where at times you can't tell where her hair and costume begins and ends. Now let's talk about the Necromongers. Their costumes are designed to be intimidating and imposing with a metallic appearance and sharp jagged edges looking like the edge of a circular blade. The armor is typically black or dark gray in color and made to look like steel or carbon fiber and is adorned with various decorative elements such as spikes and other ornamental details. The armor is also usually paired with long flowing robes or other garments which are meant to add to the necromonger's ominous and otherworldly appearance. While it's never mentioned in the behind the scenes video, as soon as I saw the costumes worn by the Necromongers, in particular the facehugger-like headpieces worn by Purifier and his ilk, I immediately thought that their costumes appeared inspired by H.R. Giger and possibly the nightmarish artwork of Zizislav Vekshinsky. Giger was a Swiss artist who is best known for his work on the Alien franchise, for which he designed the iconic alien creatures and their environments. His work was characterized by its dark, surreal, and biomechanical aesthetic and has had a significant influence on science fiction and fantasy media. I also thought that Sean Lean's aluminum and leather spine corset for Alexander McQueen's spring-summer 1998 collection was also an inspiration for the armor, while the skeleton dress, a collaboration between Elsa Scaparelli and Salvador Dali from 1838, might have been the inspiration for Dame Vaco's gowns. Concept artist Matt Codd said in a behind-the-scenes video that the Necromongers are an old civilization that maybe existed thousands of years before, and that the main goal of their look is that when they arrive on the scene, you know that they are the bad guys. He said that they try to find a balance between history and science fiction without having them look like robots. Costume supervisor Jim Tyson said, Every major actor was body cast on the film because these are custom-made armor pieces and everybody's body is different. Everybody's head, shoulder, width, size, arm length is all different, so everything is customized. But of course, there were practical considerations with the physicality of the movie and all of the stunts involved. He adds that while real armor weighs about 75 pounds, their armor weighs only about 28 pounds, saying that the actors can wear it for a reasonable amount of time before they have to pull them out of it. Now, most of the Necromonger armors were put up for auction by Prop Store Auction House, and it appears that many of them were snapped up by cosplayers. According to the auction house, the helmets are made from fiberglass, while the armor pieces are made from rubber with leather inlaid pieces. This would add to the lightness of the costumes. But before we carry on, if you're enjoying this content, please consider subscribing to my channel. The two most impressive costumes from the movie and later sold at auction are Vako and Lord Marshall's armors. Vako, portrayed by Carl Urban, is completely badass in his necro armor. He has two sets, 
one when he is commander and the other when he is promoted to general. The first one is simpler and looks like the other necromongers. One thing that surprised me, because we rarely see this in either science fiction or fantasy, is that everyone in the necro army, except for the purifier, is wearing head-to-toe armor. Even the principal cast don helmets. Valko's other armor with the embossed pauldrons and helmet remind me of the Negroli armors from the 16th century. Filippo Negroli was an armorer from Milan and might be the most famous armorer of all time. Here are two examples of this style that I think are possible influences. This lion steel armor from the Royal Armories. I've seen this armor used as inspiration on the Lannister armor in HBO's Game of Thrones and then this set of partial armor from the Wallace collection. The Purifier, Lord Marshall's second-in-command, is dressed in full goth mode with a matrix-like floor-length coat with alien-style pauldrons and a literal skull cap. His bleached white hair recalls Rutger Hauer's Roy Batty in Blade Runner. My personal favorite costumes in the movie are the two armors worn by Zyla the Last or Lord Marshall. The look is only enhanced by actor Calm Fior's bone structure and aquiline nose. According to the auction house, the four-faced helmet is made of fiberglass and features a detachable front faceplate that is held in place with magnets. According to IMDb, it took six weeks to make one head covering for Lord Marshall. There were duplicates made for the stunt double that went up for auction. I'm not sure where they took inspiration for the masks and the molded faces on the pauldrons described as mournful rictus by the auction house. I did see some resemblance to this late 16th century painting of Medusa by Caravaggio. I also saw some similarity to these Edo period iron masks by Japanese armor maker Munia Kira. They are from the collection at the Met. With a male-dominated cast, Dame Vako's costumes are a standout feature in the movie. With the scaly textures of her dresses and skeleton backbone tea tail, her costumes have a reptilian, otherworldly silhouette. Actor Calm Fior said, The costumes are extraordinary. You only have to take a glance at Tandy Newton as she passes by in this wonderful metropolis-like art deco, elegant, sexy, yet frightening thing. Costume designer Ellen Mirajnik said of her costumes, The intention of Dame Vako was you just don't know what it is she is wearing. It's just all of one, and I think we succeeded truthfully. Tandaway Newton said of her costumes, What Ellen wanted to do is show you everything and nothing all at once, which says a lot about Dame Vako. The costumes are what she calls mockadile. It's like skin incredibly tight, even going right down into my fingers, so you don't know whether it's skin stuck on or what it is. Indeed, at times it looked like Newton was wearing a prosthetic instead of a costume like we saw with the Diva Plava Laguna in The Fifth Element. Dame Vaco's slithery gown wig and headpiece sold at auction in 2018 for 5,800 pounds or approximately 7,000 US dollars. The fabric of her gown is a mesh with a raised scale on top Her gold scale is repeated in the scales worn by the necromongers, albeit in black, including in their unitards, coifs, and capes, on Vako and Lord Marshall. In a close-up of the back of her gown, there are snaps where the backbone would have been fastened in place. And while the girdle was included in the auction, both neck pieces weren't. Her other two costumes did not come up for auction to my knowledge. I would have loved to have seen some better details, but from the screen stills, it appears that the bone bodices that make up her costume are armor-like with the pieces of gold and silver metallic appliques added to create these textures in keeping with the necromonger's armors. If you've seen the Chronicles of Riddick, what did you think of the costumes? Do you have a favorite one that stands out for you? This was a fun one for me to review. I'm working on some new content for 2023 covering my favorite genres of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and more. Thank you as always for spending time with me. I'll see you in the next video.